Hey guys, Ryan here. Uh, we're coming at you in this format this week because unfortunately we had some technical issues and the sermon did not record. And so instead of leaving you guys hanging, we figured we would bring the message to you in this vlog type format. So that's why we're doing this. As always, we pray the message will bless you. So this is week seven of our series on the seven Jewish feasts that God gives his people in Leviticus chapter 23. And what we're considering in this series is how God outlines his entire plan of redemption through Jesus in these seven feasts. So there are four spring feasts and three fall feasts. And, and what we've looked at so far in this series is how Jesus has already fulfilled the four spring feasts in his first coming 2,000 years ago. And now we're looking at the three fall feasts and considering how Jesus will fulfill those feasts in his second coming. And so last week we looked at the first of the three fall feasts, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And we considered how this feast points to the return of Jesus. And we looked at two key passages, um, the first in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and the second in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, where the Apostle Paul, he speaks of the coming of the Lord in these passages and he refers to the sound of trumpets and so uh, we're, we're looking at how uh, this feast points to the return of Jesus at the sound of the feast of trumpets and, and, and what I've said last week and just something to keep in mind as we consider these three fall feasts is uh, in the four spring feasts you see how Jesus fulfills those feasts on their exact appointed days, right? Jesus is crucified at Passover. He's buried on the first day of unleavened bread, resurrected at first fruits, and the Holy Spirit is given at Pentecost. And so uh, just what we're considering is if Jesus fulfilled the four spring feasts on their appointed days, then it stands to reason that he might do the same thing with the three fall feasts. And, and so I believe that the, uh, that the Lord will return at the Feast of Trumpets, at the sound of trumpets, and ultimately, Jesus is going to return as Lord and as King to finish what he started by making all things brand new. And so that's what we looked at last week. And this brings us to the next feast, the second of the fall feast, which is the Day of Atonement. And so I want to read what it says here in Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. So the Day of Atonement, otherwise known as Yom Kippur, it falls on the 10th day of the Hebrew month Tishri, nine days after the Feast of Trumpets. So again, we talked about last week that the Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of Tishri. It's also known as the Jewish New Year. And then nine days later, on the 10th day of Tishri, you have uh, the Day of Atonement. And the 10 days from Feast of Trumpets to the Day of Atonement, those 10 days are known as the Days of Awe. Now, the Day of Atonement is the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. It is a uh, high Sabbath, and we've talked about this before. There are seven high Sabbaths throughout the Hebrew calendar. Uh, and so the Day of Atonement is a high Sabbath, but it's also referred to as the Sabbath of Sabbaths. It's the holiest day in the calendar, and it is a day of repentance and atonement. And in fact, we read here in Leviticus 23 that they are instructed to afflict themselves. This word afflict in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word anah, and it simply means to humble yourself. So during this feast, on the day of atonement, they are to afflict themselves, humble themselves. It is a day of, of repentance and confession and fasting as they uh, repent 
uh, before the Lord. Um, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter the most holy place place. And so if you know anything about the tabernacle and the temple, uh, there were uh, sort of three uh, main parts. And so you had the outer court, and then you had the inner court where the priests were allowed, and then you had the most holy place. It was the innermost place of the tabernacle and of the temple, and it was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and where the presence of God dwelt. And only one person was allowed into this space, and that was the high priest. And he was only allowed in one day a year, and this was on the Day of Atonement. So on this day, the high priest would enter into the most holy place, and he would make a special sacrifice on behalf of the sins of Israel. Now this is where things start to get really interesting, because according to Hebrew tradition, the book of life is opened on the Feast of Trumpets. So on the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of Tishri, the, uh, God opens what is known as the book of life that contains all the deeds of man. And yet judgment is held off until the day of atonement. And so this gives them those 10 days, the days of awe, to prepare their hearts. They fast, they confess, they pray, they repent, and so judgment is spared. The book of life is opened at the Feast of Trumpets, but judgment is spared. And then on the Day of Atonement, the high priest enters into the most holy place, making atonement on behalf of the sins of Israel uh, so that they're spared from judgment for uh, the next year. Now, if this language sounds a bit familiar, you know, book of life, judgment, if this sounds a bit familiar, it should sound familiar to you because we read uh, very similar words in the book of Revelation. So look what it says in Revelation chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 11. This is what we read. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so the first thing we see here in this passage is Jesus returns as a Lord. Right? You, you see Jesus on his throne. It speaks of the earth and the sky fleeing in terror and yet no shelter being found for them. And so it is uh, without doubt that when Jesus returns, he's returning as Lord, as King, and that even creation itself trembles at this reality. And so ultimately, Jesus, when he returns, he's returning as King to claim what is rightfully his. And then the second thing we see in this passage is uh, we see the dead being raised, right? It talks about the grave and the sea giving up their dead. And so, again, this is what we talked about last week, that, that when Jesus returns, he's not only returning as king, but the dead will be raised. This is what Paul talks about, and again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When, when Paul speaks of the coming of Jesus, it's at the sound of trumpets, and he speaks of the dead being raised raised to life. And so we see this here in Revelation chapter 20. And then lastly, we see uh, Jesus returns as king, right? He's on his throne. The dead are raised and brought before him. And then we see the book of life being opened. And it says that, that the dead are judged by what is written in the book according to what they had done. And so I believe that the day of atonement ultimately points to this day this day of judgment at the return of Jesus, when the dead are raised, we will stand before him and give an account for the things that we've done. Now, 
Uh, like I said last week, when we're talking about the Feast of Trumpets and now here the Day of Atonement, next week we'll talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, right? When we, we're talking about these things, we're speaking of things that have yet to happen, things that have yet to be fulfilled. And so ultimately, we don't know exactly how this is going to look like, what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. Uh, even Paul himself, when he speaks of the coming of the Lord, he, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Right? So we ultimately don't know how these things are going to happen, what it's going to look like. And, and so here in Revelation chapter 20, the question is, is, is this describing a literal event? Right? When Jesus returns, is he going to sit on a literal white throne? Is there going to be a literal book of life that's opened? Or are we going to literally one by one stand before him to give an account? Is this describing a literal event or is this perhaps metaphorically describing a, a, an actual event that will happen? U ultimately, we don't know. But one thing is for certain that when Jesus returns, he's returning as Lord and as King. The dead will be raised to life and we will all stand before him to give an account for the things that we've done. Right? In fact, this truth is found all throughout Scripture, all throughout the New Testament. This, this uh, idea of, of final judgment is, is talked about. We're not going to read these, but I'll just list these off if you want to look these up. Uh, Jesus talks about this in John chapter 5, verse 24 through verse 30. Uh, we, we see it in 1 Peter 4, 5. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, again, Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through verse 46. Uh, and then the Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 17. And on and on I could list these out. That this idea of judgment, that one day we will stand before God and give an account for the things that we've done. That this idea is all throughout uh, the scriptures. This is our inevitable future. That one day Jesus is coming back as king and we will stand before him to give an account. Now, this sounds like a frightening reality, right? This sounds terrifying, but, but there's actually good news in all of this. There, there's some incredibly good news for uh, the children of God. And, and the good news is this, that our great high priest Jesus has made atonement for us that our great high priest Jesus has made atonement for us. Now, now this idea of Jesus being our great high priest and, and he's made atonement for us is, is, is one of the central themes of the book of Hebrews, uh, one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love the book of Hebrews. And so I want to read what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 23. This is a phenomenal passage. Look what it says. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So, so what we see in this passage is uh, three reasons why Jesus is our great high priest. Uh, number one, we see that Jesus doesn't die. And I love what the author of Hebrews says here. He, he says, uh, look, look, the former priests, right, the earthly priests uh, under the old sacrificial system, they kept dying, right? They were prevented from continuing in office due to the fact that they kept dying off. They were just humans. But Jesus, our great high priest, he lives forever. He doesn't die. And so that's the first thing we see. And then secondly, we see that Jesus is sinless. And he talks about how the former priests, the earthly priests, they had to make sacrifices not only on behalf of the people, but on behalf of themselves, right? Because they weren't without sin. But Jesus, our great high priest, not only does he not die, he lives forever, but he is sinless, blameless, spot. he's separated from sinners. He himself is without 
sin, so he doesn't need to make atonement for himself. And then thirdly, and really the most important, we see that our great high priest has offered up himself as the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And and so the the picture you get, not just in this passage, but really throughout the book of Hebrews, is you get this idea of the temple being this busy place uh, that was uh, there, there was always activity going on because the priests were continually making sacrifices. In fact, it said that there was a, uh, a river of blood constantly flowing out of the temple due just to the amount of sacrifices that were taking place. And so you get this picture in the book of Hebrews of, of the, the, the priests were just busy constantly, 24-7. They were making sacrifices, trying to keep up with the demand. And yet Jesus, our great high priest, offers up himself as the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And he declares, it is finished. In fact, Jesus utters those very words from the cross. It is done. In fact, elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Jesus, our great high priest, offers up himself and then sits down at the right hand of the Father. And that's significant because, again, in the temple, the former priests, they, they never sat down. When, when they're on duty, they're constantly making sacrifices. But Jesus offers up himself one time as a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And then he sits down because the work was finished. It's done. Uh, look what else it says later in Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 24. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So each year, the high priest would enter into the most holy place on the day of atonement, to offer up a sacrifice, to make atonement on behalf of the sins of Israel. But the problem is, is is that next year, he would have to come back and do the same thing, right? And and then the next year, on the Day of Atonement, he would do the same thing. And year after year, he would do the same thing. And eventually, that high priest would die and he would have to be replaced. And year after year, generation after generation, the high priest would have to make atonement on behalf of the sins of Israel. But our great high priest offered up himself once and for all, and he's made atonement for us, and the work is finished. No other atonement needs to be made. No other sacrifice needs to be offered. The work is finished. And so the question I want to leave you with is simply this. If no other atonement needs to be made, then then why do you and why do I keep trying to make atonement for ourselves? Because this is true. I mean, I do, and I guarantee, if you were to be honest, you do this as well, where we constantly try to atone ourselves, right? We try to justify ourselves. We try to correct ourselves and make our own atonement before the Lord through our own good works, through our own good behavior, right? Through good moral, like we try to make our own atonement, and it's foolishness because the atonement's already been provided for in Jesus. The work is finished. And this is good news. And so why do we continually exhaust ourselves trying to make atonement when when the work has already been done through Jesus? No other atonement needs to be made. And so on that day, when we stand before Jesus, 
and that book is open, what, whatever that looks like, what, however it's going to play out, when, when we stand to give an account for the things that were done, our only defense will be the atoning work of Christ. And so, I mean, just think about how foolish it is to think you standing before a holy God and trying to offer up your own righteousness, right? Trying to offer up your own goodness, your own morality to justify yourselves. It's absolutely foolishness. If you think that you're going to stand before him and say, okay, God, yeah, but, 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 but look, look how often I attended church, right? right? Look, look at the good deeds I did. Look, look at it will not hold any weight on that day. Your only defense is the atoning work of Christ. And the good news is that it's enough. It's sufficient. His blood is enough to wash away all of our sin and unrighteousness. This is the good news that we have in Jesus. This is the good news that we get to rejoice in week after week, day after day, hour after hour that no other atonement needs to be made. It's been made by our great high priest once and for all. And when we stand before him, we will be justified and blameless because of the work that Christ has already done on our behalf. That's good news. So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are our great high priest, that you have made atonement for us once and for all. The work is finished. And I pray for us that, that we would simply rest in that. That we would stop tiring ourselves, trying to make our own atonement, trying to justify ourselves, but we would simply rest in the atoning work that you've offered for us. That one day you are coming as King and as Lord, and we will stand before you to give an account but we have the atoning work of Christ that is sufficient to save us. So let us rest and rejoice in it all the days of our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.